Have you ever wanted to set up a frag tank, but the thought of maintaining another system was just too overwhelming for you? <laughs> if so, then this episode's for you. We've got an example today of a frag tank that takes minimal effort to maintain. I'm Russ Kickle, and welcome to another episode of American Reef. So before we talk frag tanks, again, if you're watching this video and you find value in it, help support American Reef. How can you do that? Just by going to AmericanReef.com and subscribing to Reef Tutor. It's basically a $2 a month charge, which will give you access to over 150 uh, videos, which will teach you how to keep and maintain any coral reef or saltwater aquarium. How do you do that? Go to AmericanReef.com. From there, just go to the Reef Tutor channel and click subscribe. You'll see the PayPal button come up at the top. And then from there, it's uh, that lovely PayPal process that we all know and love. Now let's talk about frag tanks for a second. So most of us have busy lives, right? We have responsibilities as far as basically maintaining the fish tank that we already have, maintaining a full-time job, family, house, and all these other th sort of things, excuse me. And we would love to have a frag tank, but the thought of just adding another system, another cost, something else to take more of our time away, it just becomes too much, right? Well, a lot of people kind of have solved this issue by creating a frag tank and plumbing it into their main display tank. Luckily, we have Mike Paletta who has just done the same thing, and he was nice enough to share his experiences by setting up that tank and kind of giving us a tour of how he maintains it, how it's plumbed in together, and basically how he controls things like nuisance algae, things of that nature. So sit back and enjoy this episode while we go take a tour of the Mike Paletta frag tank. Today we're talking about another add-on to my system. Uh, always, as, as I've said many times, and as, to quote Joe Yaiola, we're coralaholics. So that's the phrase that jo Joe coined for those of us that have never seen a coral that we didn't like. So I'm the Will Rogers of coral keeping because I've never seen a coral I couldn't like. When I was putting frags in the big tank, they would get knocked over, they would get blown behind stuff, I would forget about them, I would lose a significant number of them because they were so small, I really didn't give them enough time to grow and crust and thrive. So by having my own frag tank now, a dedicated frag tank, I'm able to watch them, nurture them, feed them specifically, because they're in with a big tank, you feed them all the fish scattered right. around, here for the most part there's nothing that bothers them. So it's a lot easier to maintain them, even LPS down at the bottom of this tank are all my chalice frags and my ACAN frags, up above are all my SPS, and right now I'm actually using it as sort of a hospital tank too, in that uh, I had an ick outbreak in my 75 gallon tank, as I said because I got lazy and didn't feed the fish garlic. So I took all of the leather corals and everything out, all the corals out actually, and I <coughs> treated the fish with hyposalinity, brought it down to 1.018, put a UV sterilizer on, massively fed them with garlic food, but in the meantime I had to have a place to put them. So what better place than to attach them to my main tank? So this is a 40 gallon breeder tank, uh, and actually I had it just sort of sitting around. As, as I said, sure. we coral people are hoarders, so I had an extra tank, I had an extra fixture of T5 lights. Uh, there's no filtration in it. Obviously, I have 50 extra power heads sitting around. Uh -huh. So that's the water movement. And I have it plumbed, so it's plumbed into the main tank. So in that way, the water flows in, the water flows back, and it's filtered and taken care of from here. And there's not a heavy bio load in here. I'm not really feeding it heavily. I mean, I feed these corals twice a week. I shut off the water with one valve, let the water stop for a while, turn off the power head then feed them, let them sit with food on them for an hour or two until they've consumed it, 
turn the pumps back on, turn the water flow back on, gets washed out, back into the main tank and gets skimmed out. So it's a perfect system for keeping uh, frags and giving them a chance to grow because they're also getting the optimum conditions here in terms of alkalinity, calcium, and everything else. And with the T5 lights, it's a different lighting than the metal halides, but it's still bright enough to get rapid growth. Okay, so I was going to step back. Okay, so you have a 40 gallon breeder, and you said, hey, why not use the filtration that I already have? So where did you tee off of, or did you add a new pump to your system? Or no, you what I did was I teed off of the feeder pump that feeds my carbon reactor and GFO reactor. Okay. I just teed it off, so now I'm getting a slower flow through there, which isn't problematic because I wasn't running at full flow before anyway. Okay. And then the rest of the flow comes into here, and I don't really need a, a, a rapid flow. It, it probably goes through here probably three times per hour, okay. but that's plenty. I'm not really looking to, ha sure. to have to skim it or anything else. There's no filtration on it per se. There's nothing but water coming in, water going out over an overflow box. There's snails in here. And in, in terms of back to the future, I'm eventually going to add one of my old favorite fish to here, uh, black silphin mollies. I now had them for two weeks. I'm gradually acclimating them up to full salt water because the interesting thing about black self and mollies that most people don't know is they eat hair algae. <laughs> and what's the big problem in a frag tank typically is we grow hair algae because there's nothing to consume it. If you put in urchins, they knock things over. If you sure. put in snails, they move things around. Putting in black mollies, they'll eat the hair algae. And the other great thing, since they didn't come on the reef, they don't eat the corals. Right. They never bother the corals. They'll pick on all the algae around. They'll keep the glass clean. And what else is nice is they grow the nicest, the most beautiful sail fins in salt water than they do in fresh water. So you get even nicer fish. So I have three pairs of them that I, I got from wet pets. They're going in here, they'll keep this tank nice and clean. Anything, there's enough water flow along the bottom that keeps the detritus in circulation so it goes over the overflow. The only thing I will have to do is I'll have to put some netting up around the overflow because I really don't want to shoot the babies into the main tank for no reason. Sure. So my goal is to have enough babies grow up in here that I have a continuous supply of babies and self and mollies to keep my frag tank clean. Okay, so as far as the acclimation of the mollies, how long is it going to take you to take them? I tried doing it quickly in a week, uh -huh. put them in here, and they all died. Yeah. So needless to say, I just did that with regular store-bought mollies. Right. Then Ed got me really state-of-the-art, really nice black cell fins with the orange bar across the top of the cell fin. Right. So these I'm taking my time with. I've had them now for a week. I got the salinity up to 1.015. Over the next two weeks, I'll get it up to 1.025, and then I'll put them in here. All I'm using for filtration in that box is some live rock that I've acclimated to the lower salinity, and that's the only biological filtration. I feed them twice a day. They pick on the algae because the lights are on 12 hours a day, so there's algae growing on the glass, and it's a fairly simple system. And in another two week, 10 days to two weeks, they'll be at 1.025. They'll go in here. And hopefully I'll have all the soft corals out of here and all the other corals sure. back upstairs so there'll be a lot more space for them. And what's nice though, this tank's now been up a month and there isn't any hair algae, so right. I may have gotten them in vain. But I know over sure. time as I pack this tank, which yeah. I typically do, I will get some algae. So I want to have something to consume it and mollies are one of my favorites, so it works out perfect. Okay, so on that acclimation, what did you start them at? They were regular fresh water. So, so fresh water, then, then you took them up to what? One. I've, I've gone up like 1.0, 1 .0, 0 0.01 to 2 every day. There you go. So, and then your goal is after that month-ish? Three weeks, I figure, is plenty of time. I mean, okay. most places say you can do it in a week. Right, right. Uh, I'm taking my time because one, these are really nice mollies, and I hate killing even black mollies. Right, right. And two, I have the time, I have the space, there's no big rush on it. Like I said, the tank, has, every now and then I'll see a spot of hair algae. And what else I've been doing is, as I've been picking it off, I've been tossing it in there, sure, so they've nice gotten stuff. used to eating it. Right. So it's, you know, train your fish, use natural things. The other thing that I did, though, which is interesting, when I took these corals out from upstairs, uh -huh. I couldn't figure out why my A-cans were having problems. I talked about this in an earlier video, and we thought it was primarily from the lights or the nutrients or whatever. So I remember a problem I had in the past with Ascarina starfish, that is those little tiny starfish that produce like rats in a right. tank. Well, one night I bought myself a red LED flashlight. So I go look at the tank at night, and lo and behold, what I saw on virtually every LPS were some of these Asterina starfish. 
So I had Wet Pets get me a pair of Harlequin shrimp, which are the ultimate starfish predator. Like I said before, I like to have natural things consume things. So I put the pair of Harlequin shrimp in here, thinking I didn't have many of these starfish. Within three hours, I pulled off this many starfish off the glass. I know some of these even look like little crumbs of starfish, but that's how these guys reproduce just by dropping off their arms and stuff. So by taking out all the starfish, within five to six hours, all of the acans suddenly start bursting out again, fully polyping out, where before they were retracted, which is the first sign that they were having problematic, then they were kind of would melt off the skeleton, which is what we talked about. Now by having all the, all the Asterina starfish removed from this tank, and then I put them upstairs and did the same type of thing, I was able to remove so many starfish, because apparently whenever they start eating the starfish, the dying starfish gives off some kind of chemical signal for the other starfish to flee. So as a result, the starfish fleed by coming up the glass. I just came and picked them off one by one, put them upstairs. They did the exact same thing. Within three hours, all of the uh, Asterina starfish went to the glass. I then put them in here. Luckily, there were only about six or eight Asterina starfish in here. So in three tanks, I've been able to, for the most part, eradicate all the Asterina starfish. And now as if you look closely at the uh, acans, you can see how polyped out they all are. Right. Which in the old tanks, they were all retracted and dying, and then they would eventually melt off the rocks. It was from the starfish attacking them. So it wasn't from the LEDs, but it was from the starfish. Yes, and so I can tell Sanjay he was wrong. I'm never <laughs> wrong with Sanjay. <laughs>
if you have heavy flow, you tend to blow them off of what they're attached with, because okay. very few of them have encrusted. And I, I mean, I'd like to see a study versus heavy flow versus low flow to see if it increases, decreases, or is the same in terms of encrusting. Sure. So until I see that, I have a moderate flow in my opinion. So I mean, I, if I put something in there, if I put food or something in there, I can watch it blow around, but sure. I don't see it just blast to sure. one side. So you got roughly 10x, so it's not yeah. huge. Okay, perfect. And then on the mollies, you said it's a relatively simple setup. No filtration except for the live rock? No, except, except for the live rock, there's just a little power in the heater and the okay. lights. Good deal. So I, I, as I said, this is all stuff I just had sitting around. Sure. That try to make it as simple as I can. Eventually that may be a, a quarantine tank, mm -hmm. but to be honest, there's really no fish I want to add to the 300, so... Right, right. And the upstairs tank, there's minimal fish I want to add to it, so if I have a quarantine tank, it'll just be up for a, a short period of time. Okay, so in closing then, if somebody's going to, you know, add a frag tank onto their main display, what would the, be the one thing that you would recommend or tell them to do? Make, keep it as simple as you can. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You can go to any shop, any uh, uh, yard sale. You always find used tanks for sale. It doesn't have to be a beautiful looking tank and stand. All you want is something manageable. I mean, the most expensive part of this was drilling the tank and putting an overflow box in. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I always, you always have leftover stuff sitting around. Use what you have. Don't go out and buy new to do a frag tank, unless you're bringing in high-end frags and plan on selling them. I grow frags to put in my tank. I'm not fragging stuff for sale per se, in that I like big full heads of coral. And particularly after seeing Sanjay's tank, where he had heads right. of coral this big, I forgot how much I appreciate seeing big tanks. This tank hasn't been up long enough. I mean, there were three heads that I brought back from my 1,200 gallon tank that are nicely sized heads now, but I look forward to when they're bigger and fuller. Sure. And here, what, I, what I'll eventually do is, if there's things I don't like from here, I'll trade them or sell them off, and I'll move things I like better into their spots. Sure. I mean, it sounds weird to do that, but that's pretty much sure. how I've always been. I eventually will have all my favorites. I'm not going to buy a head of red dragon like this for $1,000. I'll buy a small frag and grow it to this size and then eventually put it in here. Very good. So, again, if you're just starting out, consider adding a frag tank to your main display. Keep it simple. Because there are so many frags out there. I mean, like I said, worldwide coral and cherry corals have some of the nicest frags. There's always something you're going to want to add. And the problem I always had was when I put it into my tank, it would get knocked over, blown over, something, before it really started to grow and look like something. So this gives me a chance to let them grow out some and crust. And if I really get ambitious, what I will do is when something gets big enough to frag, I'll frag it and grow bigger and bigger off of the frags and then put it in. Sure. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of things you can do when you have a, a separate tank. And like I said, I'm also using it as a hospital tank. Or, by the same token, if you have a coral in here that's getting beat up by the fish, you can always move it to the frag tank. Because it will always be your favorite coral. Sure. That's guaranteed something will hit what you really love. Mm -hmm. So, or if you have RTN or STN and you want to break up a frag and get it out of the main tank, you can put it into a separate frag tank. Very good. So it sounds like that's the conclusion of this episode. Indeed. <laughs>